Okay, looks like we are live now. Great. Welcome everyone. My name is Jeannie Aguinaldo. I'm your moderator today. Hope you had a really good morning this morning with some mindful me activities and great uh, opening keynote speakers. And today I wanna make sure you are at the right place. Um, um, this is the workshop, first workshop of the morning for stemming the tide training and certification with naloxone for overdose prevention. And just want to give you a reminder that these, um, the sessions will be recorded. Um, or they are being recorded, but they will be available um, next week for you to access. And also the slides will be uh, shared later. Um, and we'll be collecting evaluations for each day and the links will be sent to you via email. And so I will go ahead and hand it over to our wonderful presenter, Jamie Simmons, who will be uh, showing you the training that can be found on the getnaloxonow.org uh, site. Thank you, Jeannie. Uh, and thank you all for uh, coming to this session, uh, Stemming the Tide Training and Certification with Naloxone for Overdose Prevention. In a moment, moment, you'll be viewing a 20 minute training. It's pre recorded, but you'll see me taking you through it, even when I make a mistake. Uh, so I can be reading your comments and questions in the chat. Um, I'd like to start my presentation by being optimistic, but the current data on fatal opioid overdoses is not encouraging. Even though in 2018, for the first time in many years, overdose mortality decreased across the nation. 2019 data show increases, and the coronavirus has also had a huge impact. Last month, the American Medical Association reported more than 40 states have reported increases, increases in opioid-related mortality. If it weren't for the national disaster that is COVID, we'd be hearing a lot more about overdose deaths. These increases are happening despite the implementation of telehealth and other more flexible policies in the evidence-based drug treatment world, Fentanyl and a synthetic opioid you'll learn about more, learn more about in a moment is also showing up more in cocaine, methamphetamines and other substances as people who are consuming these substances may not even be aware of the risk of an opioid overdose. So we need all hands on deck. This presentation will enable you to feel confident and competent to intervene in an overdose emergency. Um, I also want you to know that after the training, you will be able to receive certification which can be used to apply to California's Naloxone Distribution Project, a project through the California Department of Healthcare Services, um, and they will provide free naloxone to community organizations to reduce opioid overdose deaths. So you will be able to receive a naloxone kit or maybe even many more uh, for your school. So I'm not sure how they're doing it, but this, um, you'll be able to get a certificate of completion for taking this training. So let's start the training and we'll have a, a little bit of time afterwards for Q&A. See you in a bit. Jamie? Jamie? I is he alive? Is he breathing? Are his lips turning blue? I don't think he's breathing. What can we do? If you use heroin or other opioids like Oxycontin or Vicodin to get high, to treat withdrawal, or to manage pain, What happened? I don't hear anything.
my apologies. Somehow the audio, I think there's a problem with the audio. Okay, I'm gonna start all over and I think it's gonna work this time. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. And please tell me in the chat if you hear it okay. If you use heroin or other opioids like Oxycontin or Vicodin to get high, to treat withdrawal, or to manage pain, you are at risk for an opioid overdose. An overdose occurs when a person takes more of a substance or combination of substances than the body can handle. Overdoses can be prevented. If you know someone who uses heroin or other opioids, including prescription medications, you can learn to recognize the signs of an overdose and respond. You can save a life. I think he's overdosed. Isn't there some medication that can help? Should we call 911? Yes, yes, call 911. 911, what's your emergency? My friend is unconscious. I don't think he's breathing. Please send help to 49 Main Street in Franklin right away. We're sending an ambulance. You need to start rescue breathing. I can talk you through it. I know how to do that. I can do that. Overdose can be prevented. Part of prevention is understanding what increases the risk of an overdose. Using or taking drugs alone increases the risk that an overdose will be fatal. Mixing drugs or using them with alcohol or prescribed medications and taking drugs when tolerance is reduced increases the likelihood that an overdose will occur. When tolerance is reduced, less of a drug is needed to have the same effect. Tolerance can be reduced when someone has stopped using a drug, even for just a few days, and then starts using it again. A person who has just been in a detox facility, drug treatment, or the hospital is at increased risk for overdose due to lowered tolerance. So is someone who has just been released from jail or prison. Other risks include having recently been sick and having a chronic illness like hepatitis, liver disease, kidney disease, respiratory problems, heart problems, or AIDS. Another high risk situation is when someone doesn't know what drugs he or she is taking or how much, but it is important to emphasize that anyone can overdose if they are using drugs, including prescription medications provided by a healthcare professional. Take a look at the overdose victim on the screen, then take note of the list of overdose risks. Click and drag the most relevant risks of an opioid overdose to the overdose victim's body. Not all the risks will apply to the overdose situation. Go ahead, give it a try. When you've identified all the applicable risks, you are finished with the exercise. Okay, so using drugs alone is clearly risky because there's no one to call for help or administer drugs. And that's the breathing and not having used drugs in a while also because of problems with tolerance. Uh, using the same quantity and period of the drug every day, not as risky. Uh, increased tolerance, no, using opioids with other medications, which is really common, poly drug use is very common and risky, mixing drugs, also just released from jail or prison, yes, being sick, not knowing what drugs you're taking, especially if you're buying them on the street, reduced tolerance is a big issue, and just left to detox also because of reduced tolerance. Congratulations, you have completed the section, Preventing an Overdose. Please click the next button to continue. If you know people who use or take drugs, it is important to learn to recognize the signs of an overdose. Opioid overdoses are the most common. They involve heroin or other opioids, either alone or in combination. Combinations include heroin or other opioids with alcohol, depressants like benzodiazepines or benzos, or stimulants like cocaine. Overdoses caused by synthetic opioids like fentanyl are also becoming increasingly common. The signs of an opioid overdose are pretty clear. The first is that the person is non-responsive. Non-responsive means that when you call the person's name or attempt to wake the person up by rubbing their chest or sternum, the person does not respond. This is different than a drug-induced nod. If someone is nodding and has not overdosed, they will respond. In an overdose, the person may still be awake, but is unable to talk, or the person may be unconscious and their body is very limp. 
Second, the person is breathing slowly or unevenly or isn't breathing at all. Third, the overdose victim's lips and nail beds, their fingernails and toenails, may be turning blue or purple. And fourth, the person may be making gurgling sounds or snoring. There are other signs, slow, erratic, or no pulse, pale, or clammy face. But to make it easier to remember, think in terms of the four main signs. Let's look again at our opioid overdose victim. Notice how he doesn't respond to his name being spoken, or even a hard sternum rub. Notice how he has bluish lips and nail beds. Notice how his respiration is so depressed that his breathing is hardly detectable. Notice how you can hear gurgling sounds. If help is not provided right away, this individual will stop breathing and die of a fatal opioid overdose. This quiz will help you review what you have just learned. You will see a list of symptoms. Click on and drag the key symptoms associated with an opioid overdose to the figure of the overdose victim. When you've correctly identified all the symptoms, you will be able to move on to the next section to learn how to best respond to an opioid overdose. You can learn how to save the life of someone who is overdosing, maybe a friend, a neighbor, someone you love, someone you know from your work, or a stranger. So unresponsive, for sure. You need to make sure the person is unresponsive, repressed breathing. Beds, nail beds and lips are turning blue or purple. Purple in a dark-skinned person, blue in a light-skinned person, uh, gurgling. Congratulations, you've completed the section recognizing the signs of an overdose. Please click the next button to continue. The best case scenario in an overdose response is for the EMTs to arrive to assist an overdose victim who is still alive. There isn't anything they can do if the overdose victim has died. This is where you come in. You can make sure the overdose victim is still alive, maybe even sitting up and talking by the time the EMTs or other public safety personnel arrive on the scene. How can you respond most effectively to an overdose? Let's go over the steps you need to take and focus on why each step is important. Ready? Okay, first, get help by calling 911. In many cases, you don't know how long the person has been unconscious, nor how much of the drug or drugs the overdose victim has used. You may not even be sure you know what kinds of drug or drugs have been used. Even if you have naloxone and administer it successfully, medical care may still be necessary. If you don't have naloxone, then 911 is even more important. So call 911. Give the 911 operator your location. Clearly state where you are. Then say, my friend or someone is unconscious. She or he is not breathing or is hardly breathing, whatever is actually happening. You can even say, I don't know if he or she is breathing. Then administer the naloxone. We will show you how to do it. It's not hard. And we will tell you how you can get it at the end of this training. If you haven't already, start rescue breathing. An overdose victim needs oxygen. If the person isn't breathing on their own or breathing is repressed, meaning the person is breathing less than 12 breaths per minute, rescue breathing must be performed as soon as possible. Every second counts. Opioids repress or stop respiration or breathing, so the overdose victim dies from a lack of oxygen. Rescue breathing provides oxygen to the brain, which keeps the heart pumping and prevents brain damage and death until the person can breathe again on their own. If you know how to perform CPR, you can do that instead of rescue breathing. If there is no response to the first dose of naloxone after about two minutes, whether or not the person is breathing on their own, administer a second dose. Synthetic opioids like fentanyl are extremely potent and may require two or more doses of naloxone. These drugs are sometimes mixed with heroin or other drugs without the user's knowledge. Once the person starts breathing again, place the overdose victim on his or her side. This is called a recovery position and it will prevent suffocation in case vomiting occurs. The best thing to do is stay with the person until help arrives. Paramedics and some other emergency responders have naloxone and can administer more if necessary, as well as take the person to the hospital. Now let's spend a little time talking about the importance of naloxone. Before naloxone was available, people tried different ways to revive an overdose victim. Some people used salt, milk, or cocaine shots. 
Others attempted to shock the person with ice or a cold shower. These are all ways to stimulate someone to respond. But a sternum rub is easier and quicker. All you have to do is make a fist and place your knuckles against the chest bone in the middle of the overdose victim's chest. Apply firm downward pressure and rub up and down across the chest. This area is called the sternum. A sternum rub inflicts a sharp, brief pain. Now try it on yourself. Good. Right away, you can see if the person is responding or not. If not, you can immediately administer naloxone. Naloxone actually reverses the effects of an opioid-associated overdose on the brain. It works quickly, and it's the best option every time. Naloxone works, so make sure you follow up on this training and get some naloxone. If you don't have it, don't despair. You can still call 911 and do rescue breathing. Paramedics and, in some places, other public safety personnel can bring it. Perform rescue breathing until they arrive and tell you to stop or until the overdose victim is breathing more than 12 breaths per minute. Now we'll go over how to check if someone is breathing or not and how to do rescue breathing if the overdose victim has stopped breathing or is not breathing enough to stay alive. Think, look, listen, feel. Can you see the chest rising and falling with each breath? Can you hear the person breathing? Can you feel breath when you put your hand close to the nostrils? If not, or you are unsure, start or continue rescue breathing. Because of COVID, people are understandably reluctant, maybe in many situations, not to do rescue breathing. There may be a situation where there's a person who lives with the overdose victim, a spouse, a, a parent, um, and you can basically explain how they can do that rescue breathing. There is a mask that comes in the naloxone kit, but it does not protect against transmission of coronavirus. Um, another, uh, but in, in, in any respect, what's most important is to provide naloxone. So if you're unable to do rescue breathing, certainly provide naloxone. If you can do both, great. How is rescue breathing done? Once you are sure there is nothing blocking the airway, gently tilt the head back, open the victim's mouth with one hand, and with the other, gently pinch the nostrils closed. Make a seal with your mouth over their mouth. Then breathe slowly, once, then twice, into the airway. Give one breath every five seconds, or 10 to 12 per minute. Allowing five seconds between breaths gives time for the lungs to expel the air you pushed in. Check to make sure the chest is rising and falling with each breath. Continue until the person starts breathing or until the ambulance arrives. When you can see, feel, or hear the person breathing, move him or her into the recovery position. Place the person on their side with their arm under their head so their mouth is facing downward. This way, all fluids will drain from the airway and the chance of suffocating is eliminated. This is also a good idea even when you are waiting for the naloxone to work, as long as the person is breathing. Otherwise, you need to continue rescue breathing. And if you have to leave for any reason, even for a moment, be sure to put the person in the recovery position. I think there's medication. Let me go check over here. I found the medication in Jamie's bedroom. It's in this little box. It's a spray. Okay, I've taken it out of the box. There's instructions on the guide. They say... Hold the Narcan nasal spray with your thumb on the bottom of the plunger and your first and middle fingers on either side of the nozzle. Like this. I've got it. Now it says, gently insert the tip of the nozzle into either nostril until fingers are on either side of the nozzle against the bottom of the person's nose. Okay. Then press the plunger firmly. Okay. Here we go. I hope this works. Jamie? Usually, if you arrive in time, the naloxone will work. It will work quickly, within minutes. But the overdose victim, now a survivor, is likely to be confused and may not remember what happened. The survivor may also be uncomfortable or upset. So let's spend a little more time talking about why it's important to stay with the person until help arrives. When people are revived from the effects of the naloxone, they may want to use more of the opioid they had been using before in order to feel better again. But doing this could throw them back into a potentially lethal overdose. 
Your presence can help to reassure the survivor and help him or her make the right decisions. Also, the naloxone will wear off after 30 to 90 minutes, but the effect of the opioid may still be powerful enough to overcome the person again. You may need to administer a second dose if the first one wears off and help hasn't been called or hasn't arrived soon enough. You can also encourage the survivor to go to the hospital. Now, let's go over the different naloxone products that are available in the U.S. We'll start with the newest FDA-approved products. Narcan nasal spray is the device that was used to revive Jamie in the scenario you just saw. It's very easy to use. There's nothing to assemble, and each of the two devices in the box are pre-filled with one dose of naloxone. In the box, you will find this flyer, the Quick Start Guide, with clear instructions on how to use the device. How do you use Narcan nasal spray? It really is quite intuitive. As the guide explains, you hold the spray with your thumb on the bottom and your first and middle fingers on either side of the device. Then you gently insert the top of the nozzle into one nostril until your fingers on either side of the nozzle are against the bottom of the person's nose, like this. Then you press the plunger firmly to spray the entire dose of Narcan into one nostril. There's no need to spray it in both nostrils. Just spray the entire dose into one nostril. Another FDA-approved naloxone product is called Evzio. Evzio is an auto-injector. The naloxone is administered through a retractable needle to protect against accidental needle sticks. Evzio comes with a trainer, a device without the naloxone, to practice with, and both the trainer and the actual naloxone device are voice-activated. A voice talks you through the administration of naloxone. How is it used? You detach the top cover of the device to activate the voiced instructions, which tells you to place Evzio on the overdose victim's thigh and press firmly for five seconds. If you press firmly enough, the needle will inject a dose of naloxone into the thigh, even through clothing, and then retract. All you need to do is follow the voice instructions from start to finish. Are there other naloxone products? Yes, often they are stored in naloxone kits that look something like this. These kits are being used across the U.S. They also usually contain two doses of naloxone in case you need to administer a second dose. Naloxone kits also tend to contain gloves, a facial guard to be used when performing rescue breathing, and instructions on how to administer the naloxone that comes in the kit. If you would like to see how to use these non-FDA approved products so you don't have to read and think about how to use them during a medical emergency, click on the link to the appropriate product. Otherwise, click next to continue. No matter what device you use to administer naloxone, after administering one or two doses, the person should begin to respond and become revived. But what if you administer the naloxone and it doesn't work? An overdose can also be caused by a mixture of substances, so one dose of naloxone may not be enough. Naloxone works with opioid overdoses, but not with other kinds of overdoses, like stimulants, benzodiazepine, and alcohol overdoses. But it is important to remember that administering naloxone for a stimulant or other kind of overdose won't hurt the overdose victim. Seeking help is always important in these cases. That's another reason why it is always important to call 911 with any kind of an overdose. When paramedics or other first responders arrive, they can provide more naloxone or use other emergency procedures like administering oxygen or CPR and can get the victim to a hospital as soon as possible. Unless you are sure the overdose was not caused by heroin or other opioids, the steps are the same. Call 911, administer naloxone, perform rescue breathing if needed, place the person in the recovery position, and stay with the victim until help arrives. Now let's try to put it all together. Take a look at the steps for successfully responding to an overdose listed on the screen. Click and drag the steps on the right of the screen to one of the slots on the left side of the screen in the correct order. When you have the correct steps in the correct order, you're done. Give it a try now. So first, Stern rod because we want to make sure the person is indeed unresponsive. Right? Then call 911. 911. Then we're going to administer naloxone. If we're comfortable doing so, we're going to perform rescue breathing. 
or ask someone else present who's already physically close to the person to do it. And we can show them how to do it. Uh, we're going to put the person on their side if we have to leave for anything to open the door, for example, for an ambulance or whatever. And um, that will protect the person. Or if they've begun breathing on their own. And here's the person who's now revived with the last one. Ambulance has arrived. We revived him with Narcan. Good job. We're happy to take over from here. You are almost finished. Here is another opportunity to review what you have learned. When you have answered all the questions correctly, you will have successfully completed this online training module. Click the Start Quiz button to begin. So, naloxone is the antidote for an opioid overdose. Opioid overdose risks are increased when people have recently been in detox, true. People mix drugs, true. Tolerance to opioids is reduced, true. So all of the answers. Naloxone can be administered by trained bystanders like yourselves. You should wait how many minutes between administrations of naloxone? Two. A sternum rub hurts just a little bit. It's to make sure the person is indeed unresponsive. If the person is in a deep nod, not overdosing, they will respond. The most common overdoses are caused by opioids. Of course, there may be benzos, stimulants, other drugs on board, but an opioid overdose that can be taken care of with naloxone, there must be opioids on board. Tolerance to opioids can be reduced when a person stops using opioids, true. A person decreases the amount of opioids they are making, they've been taking, or a person has been in detox. So all of the answers are correct. Naloxone will wear off in about 30 to 90 minutes. The drugs that they've consumed, however, may last longer, which is why it's really important to stay with the person um, and to call 911. When breathing is depressed, the person is breathing less than 20 breaths per minute. Naloxone will make the overdose survivor feel symptoms of withdrawal. And that can be very uncomfortable. Ways to help someone who is overdosed include calling 911. These other Answers uh, is what people used to do before naloxone, thinking that it could help. And in some cases, if the person wasn't really overdosing, it could stimulate them a little bit. Um, but they certainly do not work in the same way that naloxone does in as well. When performing rescue breathing, give one breath every five seconds. Naloxone works by restoring breathing, putting someone into withdrawal, reversing the effects of the overdose. I'm going to try that one. Whoops. Yeah, I was considering that. It's been a while since I've done that. So it's all of the answers. It reverses the effects of the overdose, it puts someone into withdrawal, and it restores breathing. I learned something again myself that I'd forgotten for a bit. I, you normally think about it as putting someone in withdrawal, but it does all of these things and it's reversing the effects. But it does all these things, right? Signs of an opioid overdose include the person is unresponsive and gurgling. These answers are more for someone who might have a cocaine overdose, but not an opioid overdose. Naloxone works with prescription pain relievers, excuse me, prescription pain relievers, fentanyl, heroin, other opioids. If it's only alcohol, it will not work. Only cocaine or benzos, it will not work. Or if someone though is, has used prescription pain relievers or another opioid with these substances, it will work or it should work. They may need more than one dose, but it should work. Locks are, is important to call 911 because 
You may not have enough naloxone. You may need two or more. The naloxone may not work because they, they haven't imbibed opioids or it's you've got there too late. The opioid may be longer lasting than the naloxone. That's true. So all of the answers. When tolerance is low, even a small amount of an opioid can lead to an overdose. That's the reason for a lot of tragedies. Naloxone works because it affects the brain. Fentanyl is a drug that may require multiple doses of naloxone to reverse the overdose, is extremely potent, may be mixed with heroin or cocaine without the user's knowledge. All of these are true. And it's now in most of the drug supply. It's ex extremely dangerous and a major driver of the opioid crisis in this country. In an opioid overdose emergency, the best response is the first one. Call 911, administer naloxone, perform rescue breathing if respirations are slow and you feel comfortable doing so. Stay with the overdose victim until help arrives. Okay. So we'll start, we'll go now to the Q&A. Okay, thank you, Janie. Um, now everyone can feel free to leave any questions in the uh, Q&A chat function. While we're waiting, I just want to let people know that um, there's a Spanish language bystander training, exact same training in Spanish um, on my website, getnaloxonenow.org. I don't at this time have resource pages and whatnot translated into Spanish, but the, what you just saw is, uh, is in Spanish. There's also, I think I, it would be worth it for many of you who are interested, you know, who are interested in this training, for other people to get on Get Naloxone Now, look at the homepage. There's a flyer, for example, that you can download that will, that you can use to sort of advertise it. Uh, you can give it to students, parents, other staff, uh, so that they can uh, get on and, and view the training. Again, it's free. Um, you'll be asked for a certificate for ten dollars for a certificate of completion unless you do it through um, this conference um, that helps just to pay the webmaster and, and whatnot. There's a lot of resources, articles, for example, also on the resources page that helps. Um, I'm an evangelist when it comes to evidence-based treatment for opioid use disorder, which is methadone or buprenorphine. So there's some really short but uh, very compelling articles about that. So if you're helping to educate uh, students or families about why it's important or even staff, uh, why these medications are important, um, why it is that they work, how they work, why they're better than the alternatives of which there are many, but they're not evidence-based. Um, much of treatment in this country is a sham. So it's really important that you're referring people to evidence-based treatment, especially for opioid use disorder because we have effective pharmacologic treatments. Um, it's really important to know that. Naloxone uh, is available. It's available to all of you. Um, it's available widely right now in the US. It's an emergency medication that is really uh, important for people to have. I personally think everybody should have some at home um, and you never know who might need it. It's not, uh, it's often elderly people on prescription narcotics who might forget they took their medication and take it again and overdose or not realize if they mix drugs, um, even medications pres prescribed from a doctor, you know, by a doctor, they can still get into trouble. So it's a good thing to, to have and to know. No questions? This is Jeannie, I have a quick question and I don't know if it may have been mentioned and I missed it, but is there a 
minimum age for um, being able to administer naloxone? That's an interesting question. There's, um, there's actually a website um, by an activist um, who used to use and is in recovery. He's a nurse. Um, and he actually has a video on YouTube where he teaches his children to use it and they have dolls and they're um, using it with their dolls and their young children. So I know in New York City where I disseminate naloxone uh, through, an, through a particular grant with, uh, for the New York City Department of Health, you have to be 12. But I often have, um, you know, I, I work with volunteer fire departments in the community where I live in, and uh, whole families come with their kids. Their community lost a couple of young women to, uh, to Oxycontins a couple of years ago. So whenever there's a training, they all come out, they bring their children. And while I'm not able to give them a, a kit, um, I tell them, you know, have your parents tell you where it is in case they're not around and you need to, uh, to do it and, they, and they're learning there as it is. It's incredibly intuitive. It's like nasal spray, right? If you have a cold, um, it's really intuitive. It's really easy to use and it's also incredibly safe. So if you make a mistake, you think the person has overdosed but they haven't, they had a heart attack or complications for diabetes or unconscious for any reason, uh, it will not hurt them. So if in doubt, use naloxone. Thank you. There is a question in the chat asking, what is the brand of the nasal spray? Um, the one that you saw, and although they're all there, but um, it's Narcan nasal spray. Um, there's four different um, versions of, uh, of different products that are on the website. I, you can click on them to get the other ones. There's two FDA approved ones, and that's the uh, Narcan nasal spray, which is the cheapest. Um, and there's another one, um, which is an, it's a sort of, you can inject it, but it's thousands of dollars. It's really, really expensive. It's ridiculous. So I don't even, you know, it's there on the website, um, but I don't recommend it because of the price. Another question, um, do you have a template protocol for schools to use? Um, what do you mean in terms of a protocol? I mean, this training is for lay people. Um, it's, um, it's been used by over 10,000 people without any advertising whatsoever throughout the country. Many states, departments of health um, require it um, before people can get naloxone. I know it was chosen in California. Um, for that use as well. Um, so, I mean, it's so incredibly safe. The issue mostly is the, its expense. I know um, communities can purchase it for about $49 um, a kit. So, you know, it adds up. Um, the good thing is it, it, uh, there's research that shows it never expires, although there's an expiration date of a, a few years. Um, in New York City, we're supposed to um, provide it to people if they have, if it's expired within six months. Um, but it's always, even if you have something that's years old and has an old expiration date, we say it's better to use it than not use it. And it's, it's, it probably will work. So I don't know if that answers your question. But. Hopefully it does. Um, there, uh, the follow-up question to um, the first question about the brand of nasal spray, is there a trainer for the nasal spray? I have a trainer for Evzio when I teach first aid and CPR. Yeah, I mean, Evzio um, is the really expensive one, okay? Um, and uh, because it looks a little bit intimidating, even though it, you know it's easy to use, in the, but the trainer helps with that. Um, Adapt Farmer, uh, they do have a little plastic um, sort of uh, facility, is that the word? They have a little plastic um, sort of, it looks like a toy almost. So you can feel, you know, you can see how it fits in your hand. Um, but it also comes, as I showed on the, uh, on the video, um, with a, 
a page that kind of shows with pictures that shows how it's used. Um, and since most people are familiar with it, like a, uh, a nasal spray, um, it's, it's super, super intuitive. So you really don't need to practice. Um, I mean, you can open it up and, and just see what it looks like and see how, how familiar it is and just read that piece. Um, it's in English and Spanish also. Um, so I'm not sure it's really needed. But if, I mean, if you do want it, I would contact Adapt Farmer and ask for it. Any other questions? Right now, it doesn't look like anything else has come in. Well, I, um, I was able to evaluate. Um, I'm a researcher, I'm a public health researcher, HIV and overdose um, prevention. And we were able to evaluate both this training and there's another training on the website for uh, police, firefighters and EMTs. It's called the first responder training. Both have been evaluated. They've evaluated really highly, people like it. Uh, it's a little clearer than what we saw I mean, I, I think because this was streaming, um, it wasn't as clear, but it's really quite clear. Um, and uh, you can, you know, put it so that it covers your entire, um, you know, view, you can see the whole thing. And um, so I, I highly encourage if people feel they want to see it again to do that um, as well. And then you can, you can decide when you're going to click forward or if, um, when you're ready, if you want to read over again or listen to it again, whatever, and, and go forward. Um, I think the information there is really critical. I want you to feel confident and competent that you can uh, use naloxone um, and know all the steps you need to take in order to uh, save someone's life. But um, it's, I think it's also important to know what else is on the website because I also have a Twitter account, um, hashtag get naloxone now and a Facebook account um, uh, I used to be a little bit more active on Twitter than I am now. I'm incredibly busy at the moment, but um, it's it's good to see. And on Facebook, when I find something that I really like, I really think people should read, I put it up there. So I'm more discerning on Facebook. But if you get on my Facebook page, I get in the locks on now. Um, there's a lot of really important things having to do with overdose, but also uh, evidence-based drug treatment. Is it just under your name for the page, the Facebook page? No, get the locks on now. Okay, get in the locks on now. All right. Let me check to see if anything else has come in. Okay. Um, I often get asked which is better when it comes to nasal spray or injectable. Do they work the exact same? Is nasal spray just less intimidating? Yeah, they work the same. They work the same. And um, I mean, in terms of opening the the box and taking it out and getting it set up, it also takes about the same time. Um, the nasal spray, I mean, you, you sort of take off the plastic top and then you put it into on some, you sort of put it hard on someone's thigh. You can actually go through clothing um, like, like jeans and um, you put it and it, it begins to talk to you and it tells you to push for five seconds. Um, and then you take it off the person's leg and the, the, uh, it's, it, they were given an injection essentially of naloxone, but the needle then retracts. So there's no danger of a needle stick injury. So it's very nice. It works really nicely, but so does the naloxone nasal spray. We used to have, and, and you'll see for people who still have this product, something where you had to put it together and it was in three pieces. And sometimes people fumbled a little bit and the naloxone liquid came out a little bit. I mean, it, it wasn't ideal, but we actually, um, I, because I, I put together this website and this training before, the other products were available. Um, we did, you know, pretty extensive training on how to make sure you put it together right, um, and and you had to you put you had to put half in one nostril and half in the other. So we're actually very happy to have both of these products. Um, there, there are syringe exchange sites or syringe service programs, for example, that use um, an injection too, where there's vials of naloxone. So you may see them; they're glass vials, and you have to 
you know, put a, a syringe in it and pull up the liquid and then inject it into someone's um, arm or, or leg. Um, so in, those are much cheaper. So um, some programs that don't have much money, um, particularly those that work with people who, are in, um, who inject, you know, may want to purchase those uh, because people are used to injecting and so it's not a big deal. Um, so they have those as well. But for most people, for, for communities, that the ADAPT Farmer is what's used the most. Um, both uh, pharmaceutical, uh, ph both ADAPT Farmer and Ezio do have um, product that's near the expiration date. So sometimes people are able, like police, police officers often ask me how they can get it. And I suggest they call and see if they can get some product um, that's near the expiration date so they can't sell it but they'll give it away for free there's also programs uh, that doctors for example can um, ask for free naloxone for a patient who doesn't have insurance they have to fill out a form um, but then the patient can get it for free um, but throughout certainly throughout california and through much of the country there's a lot of naloxone programs so if for people who aren't able to get it through this conference or they want to get it at a later time or they want to get more um, just google naloxone and your county or a city near you and there's a good chance that you'll find harm reduction programs that do community trainings and provide naloxone It doesn't look like there are any other questions coming in, so we can end a few minutes early. Um, okay. So I just wanna thank you, Janie, so much for sharing that very valuable information. And thank you to everyone for joining us um, with this session. Just a reminder that uh, to fill out the evaluation at the end of the day, um, enjoy the next brain breaks, explore the exhibitors. Um, there's afternoon sessions. If you go on your agenda, sometimes it's a little bit confusing the way it changes as time goes. The way it looks right now to see the afternoon sessions, you would have to scroll down and um, look at filter and click on uh, Wednesday afternoon and you can see uh, the different workshops there. Um, any other last words, Janie? Thank you. Thank you very much. I guess I guess I want to say one thing if for institutions if people um, want to um, get certificates like often we have like drug treatment programs um, in colleges I've never had um, schools for elementary or high school students but colleges often will ask, look, I want to, I want my students to see this I want to purchase certificates of completion in, in advance and so we give them they do that and we give them a promo code so there's that possibility if you work for an institution who wants to purchase certificates and then they can the students can show like the teacher or their boss or whatever that they've actually taken the training and then they're provided with um naloxone so there's um different things we can do it's all on the website if you're interested and feel free to reach out to jay simmons at nderiusa.org if you want to email me as well I apologize. There's actually another question. Um, a couple questions. Um, who did she say that pol police officers could ask about almost expired product? To the uh, a Kaleo or Adapt Farmer, who are the two pharmaceuticals that produce um, naloxone, the most common naloxone. So just Google them, and you know you can get to their website, and then there'll be someone you can call, and you can say. How can we get um, free naloxone? There's also on my website, um, there's a tab, the Get Naloxone tab for, um, there's a sister organization who provides naloxone, often uh, nearly expired or expired naloxone for free to people who use, who use drugs. So again, if they're not, if you're, if you happen to live in an area where there are not community programs, and again, you should check because there's most areas have community programs and you can get free naloxone. They're usually paid for by the department of the state department of health or local departments of health. Um, uh, they're harm reduction programs usually. So if you don't have those around and you have a student say, who's um, uh, using uh, opioids uh, or a family member or a student wants to know what to do for a family member um, then there's you can you can get they can get it 
for free if they need to. So the inf that information is on my website under the Get Naloxone tab. Uh, there was also a question about um, the certificate and uh, the certificates will be sent to your email after the conference and you'll also um, get the link if you're interested to, to sign up for the Naloxone distribution project. Yeah, do get it. It's really good to have. And I mean, also for people with insurance, I mean, you certainly if you can get it through this program, you know, through this conference, all the better. But uh, in the future, or for people who haven't, um, uh, aren't able to get access to this, um, you could go most to most chain pharmacies, most major pharmacies, and you can purchase it with your insurance uh, for a small copay. I mean, some people don't have 10, 15, 20 dollars for the copay, but um, that's another way you should know that pharmacies carry it, you know, big pharmacies, chain pharmacies like CVS, uh, Duane Reed, Walgreens, they have it. And I think that's it. So um, thank you so much, Janie, and everyone, thank you. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.